I have come to realize that the major challenge in Africa is the question of the state. Essentially, a group of people with military might capturing everybody, eliminating every other forces, going about socially now, kind of programming the society to believe that this particular power is legitimate. And also the local leader that the state will place there may not be the person that the people really like or find any legitimacy, so that creates kind of a conflict. You have to challenge in a very pragmatic way all the colonial infrastructure, socially, administratively, that was set up. Perspectives and questions towards state-making in Africa. A discussion with Ali Kaba, a PhD researcher at the American University. Some of Ali's research interests include customary land governance, rural migration, and foreign investment in local communities. Ali, he previously worked as a program director and a senior researcher at the Sustainable Development Institute, SDI. This is a Liberian-based non-governmental organization which is committed to transforming decision-making processes about land and natural resources. This is Thinking Through with LJ, and I'm your host, Leopoldino Geronimo. Ali, how do you explain the geographic and political boundaries as elements of state formation in the three countries you suggested, Liberia, Nigeria, and Ivory Coast, from where you chose to start your understanding of the African context? In our modern time, societies are organized around the state system because the state has been both a force of good for some people, but also a force of oppression for others. So the first thing I try to understand is what exactly is the state? So in our everyday discussions, there are different ways that states are defined uh, that may not actually reflect some of the assumptions that are behind uh, the state itself. So uh, we can take, for example, three uh, modern states, uh, which is a product of, of, of Europe and was expanded through uh, the European colonial project. So we can imagine that pre colonial state, there were states in both Africa and um, in other parts of the world, but it just would depend on how you define the state. So there were people, there were a group of people, they had uh, territories that they controlled, they had structures in place, they had different forms of stratifications that had leaders, uh, bureaucrats, and just commoners or subjects, right? But the pre-colonial state, the concept of boundaries, um, uh, the concept of boundary was very weak. This idea of that you have a nation state and it's a sovereign authority in our state and our sovereign authority has this control over a specific boundary. It's a modern concept that came through via the colonial project, right? As I said, it started in Europe and expanded uh, in other places. So for the modern state now, some of the questions you ask yourself, what is the essence of the modern state? You are now going to discuss the modern state, but you said it came with the colonial project. I would like you to expand a little bit on the state as a colonial project right there. So a little bit to get back to what existed before the colonial project, right? So Perfect. Africa is a huge place. There's no way that one can just sum it up in one definition of how things were. But largely, we can say they had two major pre-colonial state structures in Africa. One was a centralized system. So you had different empires in West Africa and Southern Africa, right? So the essence of these states had their own internal moral logic, which means that if a leader is bad, there were means to hold that leader accountable. And now the colonial state came about, let's say between the 1500 to the late 1800, and in some respect up to the 2000, right? Because there are some internal colonialization that happened. For example, we see Egypt 
Egypt and Sudan, Sudan and South and Sudan, or the Central Colonial Project in South Africa. So the first thing is, what is colonialism? An external power comes and impose on a people or a geography and control their, both their political, cultural, and material life. So that, is, in essence, is colonial project. And this project started not with Europeans, but the Europeans actually perfected this to control labor, which was done through enslavement, coercion, was done to control territory, which then came to a climax in the 1800 with the Berlin Conference. It was to control the culture of people, so how they think about themselves. So you see things like Christianity, you think you see things, you see our biology uh, that comes into play, right? So those are the three main ways that the colonial project was able to take control of, 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 African, um, of African societies and remake them into what we now consider the state system. Um, so in Liberia, for example, um, I don't know if I'm jumping too forward, but in Liberia, for example, the settler, uh, what, what some have called settler colonial projects, so these were Blacks that came to Liberia and essentially replicated the colonial projects that were, that were done in other places. In Nigeria, the British took over two different means, through wars, coercion, and it was not until the, the early 1900s when Nigeria became these units that we now call Nigeria. The French did the same thing in the Niagara Coast, destroyed the existing states that were there, and they reimposed the colonial state that became the Ivory Coast, 19, 1950s, when Ivory Coast gained our independence. This is then now taking us to the, the second concept that you brought in the paper, the statehood and colonial legacies. There was a relationship that you made. I want to understand how power and politics within the colonial structures, how does it manifest in a sense that it's now looking like a commodization of civil, ethnic, and other forms of wars or conflicts? It goes to this question of state formation. There are different arguments to, to state formation, right? So if you take this uh, neutral position and take the state as a moral, a moral entity, for example. So one of the arguments is that the true war you can make states, right? So war making makes states. Essentially, you have power and you impose this power on a group of people and then you are able to control them and that kind of moved into this modern system we have now called state. Um, there are other arguments about this, right? That, okay, the state actually is a product of a society. So uh, in essence, they are, moral relationship between people, you know, how you may grow from a small family into a clan, in, into a larger chieftaincy. But African states, or modern African states, really don't have the benefit. So war making was an external imposition for extraction. So the state couldn't replicate that because the state was imposed over a diverse group of people, right? So you take Nigeria, for example, all the way to the Savannah or the Sahara region, you see a diverse reasoning, logic, morality that operates between people. So now the colonial state now package all those contradictions into one territory. Besides the approaches that involve dominance through power, economic and material differences and social construction through ideas and institutions, citing Nixon here, as you said on the paper, you were very careful not to forget to analyze state making as a coercive imposition. Post-colonial leaders were confronted with the questions of forming a nation, which, may, which means making things legible, making the concept of citizen, citizenship applic applicable to everybody. But since the state itself is a neutral entity who go without logic, it can be captured with diff by, by different forces. So some leaders then reflected this ethnic composition of the states. So the person that was in charge of the state, if he's from a particular ethnic group, that ethnic group felt that they were in control of the state. Different countries find different ways to, 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 to deal with it. But essentially, many of the leaders were trying to create a nation state. And what I mean is that they had to subjugate people to create a national identity. 
So that had been one of the biggest problems for many African countries for a long while. So Julius Nyari, for example, tried to address this through what he called village, villagealization, uh, bringing, bringing a group of smaller villages together into one thing to create a modern state. But then you need to have both the resources, um, the imaginations, your neighbors will also have to buy into this. And the second part today, I think this is a negative part. When a colonial project uh, was implemented in Africa, in, in many respects, through existing power structures, right? So here, when I say existing, I do not mean that these power structures were replicated the same way they existed, but essentially, the colonial state changed these power structures in some places where they have weak leaders. They put a strong traditional leader over people. Where they had a very strong traditional leaders, or where they have strong leaders, let me not say traditional leaders, where they have strong leaders, they replaced those with weak leaders. And in the era of post-colonial political struggle, most of the state just replicated the same pattern. I'll bring you one quote of the paper here. The colonial state did not systematically integrate internal structures into the state, but rather forestalled the pre-colonial state while selectively eliminating all transforming traditional leaders. And the outcome of that, at least from my own reading and my own research, is that it created an enclave of tribal people, what Mamdani has called decentralized despots. So you create a centralized concept of people and place, and then place them on a traditional leader that are now accountable to the state, but not to their own people. So you are frozen this, this, this identity into this place. And anytime you move out of this location, you are considered a stranger, even though you are in the same state. So it affects this concept of citizenship, which is the bedrock of modern state. So the, the state has evolved now. So we have this question of citizenship. We have this question of social services and, and, and what have you. But the African state really did not take that path because it isolated and restricted people in, in these uh, enclaves, these uh, tribal enclaves that were then managed by, by traditional leaders, so-called traditional leaders that were accountable to the state. So I think that created the condition for what we now see in, 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 in many African countries. I think this is changing, but this was definitely mm -hmm. the, 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 the um, the conditions that led to uh, many of the conflicts in the 80s um, and, and, and 90s. And again, I do not want to excuse the external factors because there are definitely a lot of external features to this, but I'm just trying to focus on the internal aspect of it. There were projects which entailed a freedom in, in a sense that would unite the African nations. If I hear you now, and highlight that the freedom fighters, they've replicated the oppressive system. It does not really match with that intent of building one continent, multiple nations. How would you then place it in a discussion to understand the sovereignty and territorial autonomy of these states? Sovereignty and territorial independence are two of the major aspects of the modern states. Um, so essentially, the, the idea, and that can be both internal and external, the idea is that uh, you have a sovereign authority that has control over the particular space, the territory in which you reign. Um, and that territory will also have to be respected by external uh, by external, uh, external actors, so uh, the state system. So if I say I'm a, a state, a country, and, and for example, uh, I'm in West Africa, so Sierra Leone will have to, I'm not Liberia, for example, Sierra Leone will have to agree that I'm a state. Africans will have to agree that I'm a state. Um, Guinea will have to agree that I'm a state. The UN will have to agree that I'm a state. This essentially just a theoretical aspect because there are states that are not recognized by the state operating, but just in the theory of it, is that if you, are, you have sovereignty, you have a group of people that have monopoly over violence and they can control a particular territory, that makes them a state. 
But in the context of Africa, then, if you place that in the context of, of, of Africa and look at the colonial state and the post-colonial state, what you actually um, derive out of that is you had a colonial state that were isolated in uh, usually in um, coastal towns, and then the leadership uh, that were operating with the colonial state, either against it or for it, were the one that took over the state. And because they had to play um, within the same construct as any other state, they had to expand that, that, that authority over the whole uh, territory. And in expanding that authority, you would need different cultural uh, uh, logic that really does not confirm with, this, with, the, with the colonial state. It was not meant to confirm with it. It does not confirm with it, so you struggle. And part of the reason I think um, um, the, the Pan-Africanist movement uh, did not work. There are a lot of different reasons. I think Frank Fanon has done a very good work trying to get us through this. So one thing is the, the, the post-colonial leaders that were radical or pan-Africanist, they still had to get control over their territory. So the effort to get control of the territory became very daunting to many of these leaders, and some of them were overthrown because of it because of the, the, the internal divisions and, and what have you, some of them were overthrew and, and, and kicked out of power. Uh, some of them had to become detectors uh, to be able to maintain um, their, 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 their location. So the nationalist leaders had a lot of challenges in trying to mobilize the diverse group of people into an independent territorial national state. So whatever they produced were inauthentic because it did not reflect the plurality of people within this uh, within the system. Remember, these states were not created in some kind of democracy where people vote to be part of it or not. They were uh, they, they, they were deaf, they were borrowed from um, from the colonial uh, uh, project, right? So in in any approach now to be able to expand, they met a lot of resistance. These nationalistic leaders met a lot of resistance, but also some of these guys were also captured by their ethnic groups. So to be able to govern, they, they were captured by, by, by the ethnic groups and the states became an ethno state instead of a national state. So there were some of the challenges that, that uh, the state faced. For example, in Liberia, the state were captured by the settlers class. And from 1847 all the way to 1980, it was controlled by the same group of people. They captured the state and they really did not have the capacity to expand and nationalized identity in a way that everybody can be a part of the state. No, their idea was to maintain power, which they did for, 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 for over a hundred years, right? Um, but that really cannot be an, an authentic state. What they had is a state with a lot of contradictions and those contradictions will lead to things like coup d'etat, civil wars and what have you. And I, I want to get this clear, though, that there are external factors to this, right? But our focus now is just internal to this. There were a lot of external push for us to get Africa to where it is right now. So a lot of uh, uh, trade in, in, in guns, for example, manipulations of political leaders, assassination of political leaders, all those were part and parcel of state making in Africa. If you look back not only at the academic perspective but as a policymaker what would be your final arguments that tend to leave the whole um, package of actors into a solution-based debate so <laughs> yeah, this is a tricky one because uh, one would assume that the external actors have interest in uh, making sure Africa is right. And that does not mean that everyone external to Africa have negative view about how Africa should be. There are people that really have sincere attempts at trying to address the problems in Africa. The, the reason I, I want to place the external factors aside is to first have a clarity about internally what should be done then it's easier 
for an argument to be placed for external interventions. Because I, I would not think if the external actors had interest in making Africa a viable state system that works for its citizens, we would have seen that. But what we've seen over the years is a lot of extractions, a lot of exploitations, a lot of support for detectors that would make the same colonial and pre-colonial system. One, one, one thing is that very few people would disagree, right, that Africa has to change. The state system in Africa has to change. There's no disagreement about that. Few people would disagree about that. The questions that usually confront people is, to what? What Africa has to change to, to be able to address some of these problems, right? On the one hand, there's an argument that we should go back to pre-colonial uh, society and state system in Africa, right? There are people that make this argument. Um, and most of these, most of these arguments also reflect on the role of traditional leaders in Africa. I think this is a valuable argument, but then the questions that is not addressed is, is if we do go back to pre-colonial Africa, where or what period of time are we going to? Are we going to the period right before the colonial enterprise entered Africa? Are we going prior to that? Because there were a lot of internal colonizations, right, by African themselves. So for me, that question is mute because we are human beings, we change, we're not the same. So there's no way we can go back to what we would consider pre-colonial or, or pre-modern Africa, uh, however you, you, may, you, you may want to call it. Then part of that argument also is, that, well, then maybe the West or external actors should leave Africa alone for us to evolve through its own natural evolutions. And as I said, that is not practical because if that was practical, African leaders have been fighting all along to be able to have self-determination, to be able to have this concept of sovereignty reapplicable, but they have not been successful. So I don't think that will work. This, the, this part, the, 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 the next part of the argument is that the African society or the African state has to change to reflect the current reality that's on the ground. And what is the current reality? We are seeing a lot of young people in Africa and they are moving to urban centers. And the structure of African societies, as I said before in the colonial project, is that cities are very vibrant and cities can hold political leaders accountable. Usually the people that are left out of this frame are rural people. They do not have the means to hold their leaders accountable. So it kind of squeezes them in a way that they are not able to, to become full citizens. They're, they're, they're almost in the subject line. So my at least my approach and how other people have seen this thing is, is to create a condition in Africa that these young people can force the elders, the political leaders, the traditional leaders to adapt to their needs, to their material needs. As long as expectations from these group of people and they can hold the political leaders accountable, that will force those political leaders to not express the needs the desire, the aspirations of Africans to external actors. But level African leaders to make these negotiations, they will always want to keep their position of power. Path dependence is a highlight today as it was an introduction to perspectives and questions about state making in Africa with Ali Kaba, a researcher at the American University. I will be coming back with follow-up episodes to discuss the details of this subject in one country case study format. You're Paul Dean Geronimo, thinking through with LJ.